It starts. The here. researchers didn't really even understand what it is that they had found. While investigating a particular gene in E. coli, they noticed an interesting pattern in the DNA surrounding it. Five identical sequences, each composed of 29 bases. These repeat sequences were separated from each other by 32 base blocks of DNA called spacers, which each had a unique sequence. The scientists wrote, the biological significance of these sequences is not known. Over the next decade, these repeating patterns were found in many different microbes. Eventually, these patterns were given a name, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, CRISPR for short. But scientists still didn't know what they were for, but certain observations about them started emerging. They were always next to specific enzyme-producing genes, labeled as CRISPR-associated genes or CAS genes. CAS genes encode enzymes that can cut DNA, but at the time, no one knew why they did so or why they were always next to the CRISPR sequence. Soon, scientists noticed something else about these DNA sequences, that the CRISPR spacers, the variable sequences in between the repeating sequences, looked a lot like viral DNA. And with this revelation, the purpose of the CRISPR sequences started to become clear that these repeating patterns are a weapon that the bacteria were using against viruses. When a virus infects a bacteria, it injects its genome into the cell. If it is a previously unseen virus, a new spacer is derived from the virus's genome and is incorporated into the CRISPR sequence. The spacers are essentially a history of old infections, so the bacteria won't be infected again. The CRISPR sequence is then transcribed, creating short CRISPR RNA molecules. And those repeating palindromic sequences... I'll stop you right there, but um, I'll explain to you the application. What you'll learn from CRISPR, also known as clustered repetitive something, something pla uh, palindromic sequences, that one is the one that allows them to cut up a gene. And that allows you to actually fix an error in your genetics, in your DNA. Now, it's possible to actually edit your genes, whether to have stronger bones, to have taller, uh, to make it taller. Those are like uh, some applications, but also you can actually cure blood sickle cell diseases. That's one. Today, you can actually see them apply it for, um, for cancer. It can be used for cancer. And uh, right now, they're also using CRISPR uh, gene editing per se. Of course, you've heard about GMOs, genetically modified organisms. We have been editing corn, fish, tomato, a lot of agriculture, plants and animals. They, they, they have been edited so that you have longer fresh um longer lifespans for your tomatoes you can have bulls without horns etc that's what you'll learn today this is our genomic revolution and what you notice here is that the ascent from 2020 was continued and sustained in 2021 why is there a 500 percent in an etf in a single year what exactly is happening prior to um, the last seven, eight years uh, on this technology. CRISPR is actually since 2012, so this is almost a decade. In 2020, it should be noted as well that in December 8, two scientists, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, both women were actually awarded the Nobel Prize for their work on this innovative, revolutionary CRISPR technology. So ARCG is actually an investment fund that primarily targets and invests solely in this revolution. They develop, um, they look for companies that are developing, producing, enabling CRISPR, targeted therapeutics, bioinformatics, molecular diagnostics, stem cells, and agricultural biology. So it's a very good fund, and we will discuss why we think that this, uh, this, Big Ideas 2021 is a great investment story that uh, it's not just narrative, it's actually going to affect all of the people's lives. So there was actually a project, it was called the $1,000 Genome Project. This referred to an era wherein you have the personalized medicine because you could fully sequence an individual's genome, also known as 
Pool Genomic Sequencing, WGS. And they had, a, they had a view that they can lower the cost from $1,000 perhaps to something cheaper. In fact, it was more than, uh, more than thousands of dollars before. So from 2001 to 2019, the cost per genomic sequence has been falling with the rise of a lot of artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. Now, by late 2015, the cost was actually below $1,500. The more WGS, the more whole uh, gen genome sequencing you're able to do, the more data, more data plus um, more deep learning will tell you that, um, so deep learning is different with machine learning. That's something that you will, you will have to understand. It's an intermarriage. It's going to have large implications and applications to finding out the vaccines for very rare diseases. The $1,000 genome was a catchphrase in December 2001. That was 20 years ago. It was a scientific retreat discussing the future of biomedical research following the first publication of the Human Genome Project, HDP, covered by National Human Genome Research Institute in Virginia. The phrase was actually about the cost of the Human Genome Project, which was estimated to be $2.7 billion over a decade. And the benchmark was actually to have affordable personal genome sequencing. That, um, that used to be very expensive, um, but now we are actually below $400. The cost per genome is something similar to the cost of how solar happened, the revolution. The cheaper it is, the better access, the more ideas would happen. So used to be that the cost was what? $100 million. The $1,000 was like a pipe dream, but we actually reached below $1,000 already. Similarly, there was even uh, a company in 2017 called Illumina promising to sequence human genome for $100, but not quite yet. So it was a promise, but uh, that was something that they, they had in plan to lower down the cost of decoding for a human genome from $1,000 to $100. Happy to tell you that in the brief history of genetics, we first started with these chromosomes. Perhaps in your science class, you heard about inheritance, genes, genes and cr chromosomes, DNA. At present, we actually have several machines, and uh, there's an explosion in whole genome sequencing. Illumina came in around, uh, around early 2006, but in 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, there's actually better versions and uh, more publications as well about whole genome sequencing. We had the Sanger sequencing versus Illumina sequencing. This was the first prototype sequencing. The second version was Illumina, which had a better advantage. Single nucleotide resolution, studying variations between samples, no primers, no cloning. The generations of sequencers evolved from Sanger uh, sequencing by synthesis. And right now we have the smart sequencing. Smart sequencing is actually your pack bio. And more importantly, how much does pack bio sequencing cost? Pack bio costs internally $450, these smart machines, $15, $44, $340, It's very cheap. External cost is to sell these at these levels. So you could see that the um, genetic revolution is happening because of the rapid cost drop of uh, actually understanding your DNA. And more importantly, there is this new technology called long read sequencing. Why don't you understand first what pack bio sequencing means with long read sequencing? It's just one minute. Let's listen. Introducing the pack bio SQL2 system powered by single molecule, real time, or smart sequencing technology. Here's how smart sequencing works. First, from any sample type, ranging from viruses to vertebrates, DNA or RNA is isolated. Next, a SmartBell library is created by ligating adapters to double-stranded DNA, creating a circular template. Primer and polymerase are added to the library that is placed on the instrument for sequencing. At the core of smart sequencing is the smart cell, which contains millions of tiny wells called zero-mode waveguides, or ZMWs. A single molecule of DNA is immobilized in the ZMWs, and as the polymerase incorporates labeled nucleotides, 
light is emitted. With this approach, nucleotide incorporation is measured in real time. With the SQL2 system, you can optimize your results with two sequencing modes. Use circular consensus sequencing mode to produce highly accurate long reads, known as hi-fi reads. Or use the continuous long read sequencing mode to generate the longest possible reads. What's important there is the 99% accuracy, and we can actually get a cheaper way to uh, read your data, read your DNA. Wait, stop this. And the PAC bio benefits of long reads is that you get span large, peat, large repeat regions, genome finishing. This enables you to actually have cancer structural variants better determined. Short reads cannot capture variable regions between uh, alleles, important for many. It's actually antibiotic sequencing. And RNA gene sequencing is something that uh, most, most geneticists know about. So this is a better uh, read on your uh, body. Now, the PacBio SMRT is sequenced by immobilized DNA. This is one of their slides. Um, it says here that it's more accurate with 99.99% .99 accuracy and 30 times coverage. So they can actually read all of the diseases within your uh, system, whether uh, whatever it may be, E. coli, perfect consensus, little or no sequence bias. So they're seeing that uh, this is actually a very cheap way to diagnose you. And uh, PacBio can also do the same thing, better quality, uniformity across extremes. Uh, these are some of the outcomes. Uh, they can actually understand all of your ancestors. Your genome deserves long reads. So, and it, it's applied for every, everything, not just humans, but also plants, fish, animals, so humans, pigs, sheep, everything. Back bio advantages, structural variants. So it, it is enabling all of these, as they said, 30 times more variants and uh, tenfold pack bio. So it's a better system. Essentially, for people who are not doctors, I think what it means is that it's just a better system than what you have in the past. Uh, long sub reads, these are all the barcodes that they're saying. And then another webinar from them. We don't need to watch that, but I just took a highlight of uh, what I tried to understand from all I could understand as a layman is that PacBio can actually diagnose you better and understand and see a detection, detect whether you would have um, any problem, whether you are allergic to peanuts, for instance. Uh, wait, sorry, stop that. The beautiful thing is that just recently, another better, uh, there's even another better pack bio, which is bio nano workflow. This is about two minutes. Watch this. Three minutes. Bio nano genomics. This is Sapphire from Bio Nano Genomics. With it, you can directly image the genome in high resolution to detect variations such as deletions, duplication, translocations, and inversions known as structural variations, where sensitivity is high as percent. The process is simple and automated to enable routine use in disease research. Structural variation commonly occurs in a broad range of diseases, including neurodegenerative diseases, intellectual disabilities, and various types of cancer. In fact, the first targeted cancer therapies were based on gene fusions, a type of structural variant. Given the role structural variants play in both understanding and developing potential targeted therapies, it is important that structural variants are accurately identified or called. To do this, there are two fundamentally different yet complementary approaches, sequencing and whole genome imaging. In short read sequencing or next generation sequencing, DNA is read in short segments of about 150 base pairs, and the read sequences are compared to a reference genome. It can characterize small variants, but structural variants are often tens of thousands of base pairs or longer, so short read sequencing is not an accurate way of calling them. What's more, two-thirds of the genome is repetitive, and structural variants in repeat regions are often invisible by whole genome sequencing. Whole genome imaging with the SAFIRE system takes an entirely different approach to understanding the structure of DNA through imaging. 
it has proven to accurately identify structural variants ranging from 500 base pairs to whole chromosome lengths with sensitivity as high as 99%. First, native ultra-high molecular weight DNA, multi-megabase pairs in length, is isolated. Fluorescent layer... I'm going to stop you right there. Basically, it's the, the point of the video is to tell you that it is better than PacBio. But um, the point also is that there's so many ways to actually understand you today. This is actually a very good video about how bio nanogenomics done by Walrus Street, done by Wal Mr. Walrus Street about bio nano. I actually watched it. It's a very good uh, in-depth in insight, not about hype. Um, and this is something that I want you to understand. There's, there's been growth in studies using so many sequencing. Example, amplicon sequencing. This is what you now have today. CRISPR validation, antibody screening, metagenomics. You're seeing genomic sequencing cheaper and cheaper by the day. Dante Labs can do $200 whole genome sequencing promotion. And whole genome sequencing means that they can uh, understand everything. Uh, so it's not just the 23andMe that knows about your ancestors. This is more. There's also the direct-to-consumer whole genome sequencing. This is $299. So as you could see, $200, $300, it's very cheap. Whole genome sequencing would better understand your individual health, a more complete way to understand your risk across diseases, lifestyles, and hereditary traits in order to prevent it. So prevent your cancer before it happens and potentially treat it before it happens. Consumer genomics is uh, getting a lot of funding from venture capitalists. You'll notice that 23andMe actually um, uh, no longer requires follow-up testing for certain medications. Just recently, Virgin Branson, uh, VGAC, uh, went into a SPAC with 23andMe. The DNA company buys my pain Sensei for roughly $30 million. This is a direct-to-consumer genomic startup, uh, and it's actually going to analyze uh, your genetic information to manage chronic conditions. Now, there's also uh, an app similar to 23andMe called Ancestry. They got a clearance pointing towards genetic health risk testing. And they're launching their next generation sequencing product. So you'll notice that more and more, uh, just like electronics have been mainstream, genomics uh, testing is going to be mainstream. And what is this, Wright's Law? What this clearly tells you is that the reason why um, the current $1,000 genome project could go $500 is simply because of volume. The more people would, uh, would buy the product, i.e. get the genomic sequencing, the rights law said that you can lower the price. So if 1,000 volume went to 2,000, to 4,000, to 8,000, every doubling of the volume and every price of 10% discount because of that massive volume will mean a lower price and a lower price and a lower price. Therefore, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years. Within eight years, you're going to see uh, whole genomic sequencing very cheap. The cost will fall by a strong drop. And so far, what you're seeing also is that the cost has already dropped. Wright's Law has been happening all throughout the entire genomic sequencing. The genome editing technique today for CRISPR in 2012 cost something approximately just $30. That is so cheap versus the ZFN and Talens, which used to be $5,500 and $360. And so with this... This revolution, this cheap cost of sequencing your DNA has enabled total number of human genome sequence going stronger, 10 million, and is expected to hit 170 million. The more data, the more that deep learning and machine learning and AI can actually uh, learn about your data and diseases and prevent cancer. If In fact, they can even perhaps cure it. So a lot of articles are already saying cheaper DNA sequencing is unlocking the secrets of rare diseases. The routine genetic testing would save the healthcare system money, says the UK medical chief. It's going to be a global thing. You're talking about 7 billion people or let's say about 6 to 5 billion people potentially doing a lot of genetic whole genomic sequencing testing. 
So artificial intelligence, in my view, would help genetic sequencing companies with the massive computational lift required to discover the new links between genetics and health in the growing DNA database. Sequencing of people who have, let's say, a life-threatening reaction to peanuts, and the company could even find mutations in a particular stretch of DNA that correlates with having the allergy. I wanted you to see the, the applications of CRISPR because CRISPR can be like a scissor. It can cut through your DNA. It can edit. And because it can cut that, they could target a certain um, G or A or T or C. So uh, you've probably watched the movie Gataka. It was a fiction, science fiction movie, but that science fiction movie is actually a reality today. So for the past 30 years, people are saying that we have been making towards making whole genome sequencing affordable and accurate. Today, the goal of reducing the cost of 30x whole genome sequencing is now less than $300, making it accessible and available all throughout the world. So these are uh, the relevant companies that are doing these genomic sequencing, PacBio. CRISPRs is, of course, the shorthand for clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. So before in the bacteria, they didn't they, in the bacteria they didn't know what that repeat repetitive palindromic uh, G A T C G G G G G A A A C C C they didn't know what it was. Apparently, it can cut, so it can actually be used to edit. And um, Jennifer Doudna, a lot of researchers uh, learned that you could actually have so much applications with editing that gen genetic sequence. So. They sandwich remnants of DNA from viruses that once infected the bacterium, forming a database of past invaders that helps prokaryotes fend off future ones. At the time, scientists knew that CRISPRs were part of this prokaryote immune system and had identified some of its components, but they were still trying to sort out the details of how it worked. They saw it, they didn't know the application. Around 2012, uh, Jennifer Doudna actually discussed how CRISPR lets us edit our DNA. This is a TED Talk, uh, 2015. She is an American pioneer working in CRISPR gene editing. She even won the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry along with Emmanuel Charpentier. Wait, we don't need to watch that, but uh, I want you to watch that. That's 15 minutes on the TED Talk. This is both of them. Both women won. They co, uh, they co, um, how should I say? They work together. And they both won the Nobel Prize. This is a very good video that you can watch. It's 30 minutes each. It's a Nobel lecture, both of them discussing what they're working on. And um, you have to understand that Jennifer Doudna is now considered as Beyonce of science. Um, if you're thinking that electric vehicles, Elon Musk is number one. In, um, in the CRISPR technology, in the editing technology, uh, example, if somebody asks you who invented um, electric vehicles, you might say, um, sorry, people would say that electricity was invented. Some people would say electricity was invest invented by Thomas Edison, but some people would say it was Tesla. Now, in, when you're going to ask me about electric vehicles, whether it's not true that Tesla invented it, but people are aware that when you say electric vehicle, the category in their mind is Tesla. So when you're thinking about CRISPR, you're thinking about Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, both of them. That's what you think about. When you think about CRISPR, uh, the shorthand, which is the long clustered, la la la, palindromic, blah. That one, the, the people you have to learn about, the Cas9 DNA RNA, that one is uh, Jennifer Doudna and Charpentier. They both saw the applications for this technology. I'm going to show you the patent thing, the patent. There was even scandals about the patent because uh, United States, China, and Europe somehow uh, were, were how I, there, there was a little bit of a scandal on uh, who was the first to actually in, uh, learn about CRISPR. In a recent analysis of more than 2,000 patent inventions, uh, distinct inventions involving CRISPR, United States barely edged out China. Applications from China climbed rapidly in recent years, and the country is dominating in agriculture and industrial realms. CRISPR is actually very strong in so many applications, particularly medical and agriculture. So you can actually edit a lot of plants, uh, food production. So you can actually make that plant grow bigger, last longer, stronger. And uh, it's actually telling people that superhumans can be created, designer babies. Those are like ethical morality questions that some, uh, some people actually... Uh, 
try to understand with uh, these uh, with this technology. China catched up on papers, uh, caught up when, when it comes to papers. Is China, this United States, Japan, Germany, and other countries. Number of papers for 2018. So a lot of scientists are also becoming entrepreneurs. And there are some people who are using this wildly popular genome editing research tool, which was invented in the West, but is speeding more towards the potential human applications in China. The Chinese team actually worked, sparked a worldwide debate because in 2015, there was a Chinese doctor who actually edited a human em embryo, the first one in the world. And um, this, uh, and of course, they can also correct mutations uh, on a debilitating blood sickle cell disease. Uh, the most striking evidence of progress was found in China, where, wherein um, there were patients, nine of them in China, with safety ethical reviews. Uh, they were infusing cancer patients with immune cells modified using CRISPR and um, essentially healing people with cancer. Amazing. So CRISPR as systems, Nobel lecture, we, we, uh, in her Nobel Prize lecture, he talked about, she talked about the ad adaptive antiviral immunity. Uh, and this is something about, uh, in 2020, articles about her, because she's like the rock star of CRISPR. Uh, I did with Jennifer Doudna. She's the Elon Musk of CRISPR technology, the Beyonce of science. That's what they call her. Uh, trying to keep up with one of the world's most sought-after scientists. Uh, living and breathing the science. This is uh, her normal work schedule. So much students. Uh, she loves to still be a professor, uh, but she is actually teaching students who are actually the entrepreneurs and founding many startups in the CRISP. Uh, they're working all together. So the decision is really uh, about keeping up with the broader asp aspirations for her students on how um, the these technologies could be applied. She's very much, um, she's, she's very well known in her field, even before CRISPR. She, she um, breakthrough prize gala, for instance, in Silicon Valley, everyone wants to fund her. Amazing feats of science. How does she run a big lab while well, founding multiple companies? Everyone says that how could Elon Musk fund, uh, how could Elon Musk have Tesla and SpaceX and OpenAI and Boring Company and Neuralink, five companies? Well, this girl has more than five. So I guess like... Um, Five and more. Um, so I think like when you're the pioneer of a technology, a lot of people will really want you to be their professor uh, or at least their mentor or board of director and so forth. And uh, it's totally fun. We struggled through some data going over figures. It was totally fun. Uh, they, and then she, 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 uh, her, her work day is really a lot. So I love the science. I wake up in the morning. The first thing I think about when I go to bed at night is usually the last thing I'm thinking about. You can hear her talk, actually, when you just read articles and listen to her uh, videos. But the possibilities for CRISPR tool is very us to treat for tweaking crops to be efficient and resilient and even to rewrite the code of life itself. So there were some people who said that, can we extend people's lives? The answer is possible. CRISPR scientific impact was of a magnitude rarely seen in science. Its discovery fundamentally the course of Duda's life. She's always been considered a great woman scientist, world-class scientist, but after CRISPR, all the accolades came. And of course, she's a Nobel Prize scientist uh, along with Emmanuel Charpentier. Some of the companies she co-founded, Caribou Sciences, formed 2011, Edita Sciences, promising to heal the blind, uh, Intelia Therapeutics, 2014, based on Cas9 technology, Mammoth Biosciences for health, agriculture, environmental applications based on Cas12, 13, 14 technology, and Scribe Therapeutics, form 2019, based on Cas10 technology. She is still part of the original founding team, but is no longer connected to Editas. So these are these companies are actually uh, some of the her own students' uh, most uh, cutting edge work. So they actually can cut the DNA. DNA sequences can be disrupted. And uh, in, in their words, for layman's words, if there's a typo error in your, if this was a sentence, if there was a spelling error, the way to fix it is to, to cut the error and to fix it. So that's what the CRISPR is for layman. 
Genome editing can happen in everywhere, large animals. Um, these are actual journals, the crop journal, improving efficiency of CRISPR-Cas12A system with tRNA, CRNA arrays. The first human trial as a new treatment for late-stage lung cancer by Shong Hui He, 2020. Genome editing, small size cast and shining. B3. Off target single nucleotide uh, variants. You've got prime editing promises to be a cut above CRISPR. This is base editing. This is also a very interesting technology again. Editing the editor, genome editing gets a makeover with CRISPR 2.0. Fields of dreams, CRISPR engineered T cells is in patients with refractor, refractory cancer, a gene drive makes its debut in mammals. So basically, if CRISPR is the version one, we're getting version two, version three, a lot of applications scattering all over the world. It's amazing what this technology is doing around the world for medical breakthroughs. So um, this is actually a Venture City four-minute video whether CRISPR gene editing will transform cancer treatment. You want, I want you to watch it. If we have time, I'm going to let you show, uh, I'm going to show all these great videos. Uh, but there's like so many things to discuss today. So I'll just uh, put it first here. We'll watch it later on. This is a very good TED video. Can we cure genetic diseases by rewriting DNA? This is by Dr. David Liu. He's the CEO of Beam Therapeutics. And um, they show that they're actually able to solve cancer. Amazing, guys. Amazing. Um, it's a 16-minute video. Uh, this is actually the devastating consequence of uh, blood, sorry, so not cancer. This is a blood sickle cell disease. So they know essentially what is causing this devastating consequence. Children um, are aging so fast, and these people who have this uh, blood sickle cell disease would die by age 14. Uh, so how do you actually prevent that to happen? You have to uh, change the cell, the C to T. And because they can target it, they were able to save so many people's lives. So this one, you cut that to sow in a bacteria encounters a virus for the first time. You're talking about this Gataka stuff, ACGT, ACCA, la, 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 la. those ACGTs. Like a scissor, you cut it through CRISPR editing tool. And when you edit it, tada, no typo errors. And you don't have that error in your genome. No blood sickle cell disease, no death. The first human trial of CRISPR cell-based therapy also clearing the concerns for a new treatment for late-stage lung cancer. There are so many references. You could see that this is Jennifer Doudna, the promise and challenge of therapeutic genome editing. This is what they call research papers that every doctor loves to read and read and read about, all the scientists, so that they share all their um, work together. So Lou, Y et al., safety and feasibility of CRISPR-edited T cells with refractive, refractory non-small cell lung cancer, the clinical potential of gene editing for engineer cell-based therapeutics. This is for HIV and acute lymphotic leukemia. Imagine that with stem cells. Beam Therapeutics is listed. It's a pioneering the use of CRISPR-based editing targeting that uh, treatment to disease one letter at a time. So let, whether that's a B, uh, whether that's an A, a C, a T, a G, one letter at a time. Launched in 2018. So uh, this company is actually an amazing company. Biotech developing precision genetic medicines through the use of base editing. It has risen already from 20 to 100, but this $100 is just $5 billion. How many lives will we save? 5 billion more lives, 100 million lives, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how many people have blood sickle cell diseases, but I think that this base editing of beam therapeutics is amazing. Uh, so we want to actually understand this company better and further. Beam has broad and diversified portfolio. You've got Beam 101, 102, the program diseases that they are, they're solving, sickle cell diseases, beta thalassemia, uh, sickle cell disease, T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, leukemia, antitrypsin deficiency, glycogen storage, star guard diseases, and all that. So there, I mean, they have their work. This is the first human trial of a CRISPR-based cell therapy, the new treatment for late-stage lung cancer. This has been done in China. So in a study recently published in Natural Nature Medicine, Lu et al. examined the feasibility and study of using CRISPR, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. Clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. It's so long, that's why we'll just talk about CRISPR. 
re-engineer patient-derived T-cells to treat late-stage lung cancer. The important thing to tell you is that they demonstrated very low off-target editing rates, no severe treatment-related adverse events supporting the general safety for clinical use. So, of course, you've heard about designer babies, designer humans. Those are moral, ethical things, and we have actually already designed plants and animals. How do you know about this? Well, you've heard about it. It's called the genetically modified organism. These are GMOs. These are animals and plants, microbes whose DNA has been altered using genetic engineering techniques. For thousands of years, humans have always used breathing methods to modify organisms. Corn, cattle, even dogs have been selectively bred over generations to have certain desired traits. Now, this genetic engineering has the potential to greatly improve the health and welfare of agricultural animals. G animals will be disease resistant, parasite resistant, and they would withstand stress. The benefits could act outweigh and improve all the well being because they will be more productive. I want to show you a few things. So, you've seen this gene editing was demonized by many people who didn't understand it, but today, fungus treated tomatoes are seeing 65% high yields in how study shows. Using CRISPR, you disable the gene where the enzyme will degrade the cell wall in the fruits. Syngenta, the company, is developing an edited tomato. This is the edited tomato that has a longer prolonged shelf life. Imagine that, genetic tomato. So that comes from Syngenta Beijing Innovation Center. I haven't checked if Syngenta is listed, but you might actually want to check it out. Syngenta Beijing Innovation Center. These are gen genetically modified organisms. The science about it. And this is what cornice happens with lower cost, but we are able to promise you. So far, a lot of scientific journals are saying that GMOs are producing up to 10% more than similar types. So they are bigger, they are stronger, it's a better corn. Now, I took a look. Origin Agritech is actually one of the leaders that are listed in New York Stock Exchange. The current symbol is SEED, Crop C Biotechnologies. Origin Agritech's phytase corn was the first transgenic corn to receive the biosafety certificate from China's Ministry of Agriculture. Now, a lot of people would say, oh, that's GMO. I, I'm going to have a disease if I eat that. No. As of July 2020, Origin has established a robust biotech seed pipeline, including products with glyphosate tolerance and pest resistance traits. A lot of our Origin Agritech's website is in Chinese. So um, if anyone can help me out understanding the press releases, um, it would be better. So um, ticker symbol is SEED. Origin Agritech highlights its ability to produce GMO corn seeds. Origin Agritech wins the grant for two, two of its two uh, GMO corn traits. So far, it's trading at about $20. I think it can go higher. So you could see the pages on Origin Agritech Limited. Uh, they're editing corn, so um, they can produce more corn. There's so much. Of course, this is a fish, genetically modified fish, that's soon to be on the table. This is a Belgian blue, an ugly but tasty cow that has 40% more muscle than it should have. It is the product of random mutation followed by selective breeding. Indeed, all domesticated creatures where the old art has led, a new one may follow. Understanding which genetic changes have been consolidated in the Belgian blue, it may be possible to design building similar versions of other species using genetic engineering as a shortcut. So fish biologists. It's one of the reasons why you probably heard about art genomic, art genomic revolution investing in AQB, aqua bounty, salmon. I'm going to discuss later um, a few companies inside ArcG. But take a look what's happening in the world. Gene editing could help save the planet if scientists can avoid the typos. Typos meaning the errors. If, you're, um, if your genetic sequencing had a typo, they're going to fix that typo. This is two heifers at the University of California. One of these cousins has a genetic code to prevent horns from growing and one doesn't. This has a horn. See that? This one does not have a horn. So gene editing can help save the planet. We can grow more food, less land, allow more of the earth to grow carbon-sucking forests and savannas. Uh, marvelous potential for gene editing. The main advantage is precision. So randomness of breeding is hard. So we can get... Um, that's why there's actually some, some, some startups. I've heard about them. It's called Memphis Meats. It's cell-based meats. Basically, it's, uh, it's cow made from the lab. 
Well, you, you could either say made from the lab or cloned from the lab, genetically engineered lab, whatever you want to call it. So a lot. So there's a lot of things happening in the world. The steak you're eating could be a genetic, genetic steak. So nature biotech. All right. So the controversy over GMOs, to be clear, the cows at the center of this stage have nothing to do with creating more productive, pest-resistant foods. Farmers are usually removing the horns to prevent the cattle from injuring each other. Goring is a real danger. So the horns, they fight over each other. So what, what farmers usually do is to cut the horns, which is very painful for the horn. It's very painful for that cow. So since um, some cows are naturally hornless, Angus and for breeds, for instance, those are beef cattle. But for dairy, you want Holsteins or Jerseys. So that these cows will never suffer through a painful dehorning operation, a veterinarian burns out their horn buds. Can you imagine if you were a cow or a, or a calf or bovine? You're going to have a burn and then you're going to be killed eventually. I mean, I don't know. I know that I shouldn't be talking about animals, but just imagine. So let's help them as well, even if we're going to eat them afterwards what if you just block a single gene and move it into dairy cows so with gene editing you could tweak dairy cows without messing up their finely tuned milk producing dna so they don't have to endure dehorning uh, a technique called talons but you might have heard of crispr which is a different version of the same thing so you're you're, you're seeing these technologies guys the way to feed more people in china is actually to do big genome editing crops I'll be fast, feed the 1.4 billion, bet big on genome editing. I'm just showing to you pictures now. Kaisha Gao, crop engineer. So I'm going to show to you all these pictures um, of what's happening in China. Very successful gene editing on crops uh, and uh, common fungal. This is actually very good. The plentiful future, Xiao Hanyang, genome insider. Transcripts of the episodes, listen to that. Okay, new sensors right now could offer early detection of lung tumors. I'll share this all to the class. But for now, I'm gonna sh um, I have to give the presentation to our collaborative host, Sir Robinson. Sir Robinson, um, I pass this over to you. All right, I would stop my video. And I'll, oops, where are you? Wait. Are you there? Yep, I'm you here. Share your can you, can yeah, you yeah. hear me? Um, yeah, I can um, hear you. Do you need me can to I share give you it? the hosting? Uh, wait um, up. Let me try. Are you, are you given the hosting already? Yeah, you have hosting. So just share your files. Okay. And uh, um, we'll go through the genomic revolution later on together. So go okay. present. Um, Sorry, they took your time, but go ahead. I, I think like the, <laughs> the class could be longer today. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you did it. To you everyone did it. who's new here, uh, Robinson is an oncologist, so he'll know this this better. So, so, uh, so, so, so I'm ahead. not an I'm not an oncologist. Just a um, just a plain old doctor. Oh, oh doctor. <laughs> Okay, no worries. So how do I watch? Are you already sharing? No, Oh, he's, he's gone. Don't worry. Uh, we'll wait for him. I'm screen sharing uh, his presentation. This is an amazing presentation, by the way. Um, all right. Hey, Nikki, can you can you hear Hi. me? Yeah, I hey. can hear you. We're hearing. Good. We're here. Yeah. Can Can you go ahead and uh, share it? Because I'm having some issues. Kind no of. No problem. Sharing. No problem. So I'm sharing it, and then uh, I'll just listen to you talk. All right. Okay. We can hear you. Okay. All right, got awesome. it. So just let me know if next. So when you say next or yep, yeah, I'll I'll do the slideshow. Got it. I'll just I'll I'll cough or something like that so that way. Mm -hmm. Sure. So let's start. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Um, do you have it up or? Deep learning. 
Um, so I'm we're already on your page two, deep learning. Hold on, let me see here. Sorry, for some reason. Um oh slide is yeah. un visible, it says here. Oh wait, wait. I'm gonna share your the slides. How yeah. about this? Everyone can see. Big ideas okay. 2021. Yep. Deep learning. Okay, perfect. All right, let's go. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So um so basically, you know, I I wanted to uh, kind of go through this because I think it's super important, um, and it and it's really just awesome to that Ark, you know, who who I I think has helped us along with Nikki um, learn a lot about what is coming around the corner, um, and so there's three particular areas that that I looked into um, and going to share with you. The first one is deep learning, uh, and then and if you go to the next uh, key. Um, also, uh, Bitcoin as well. Um, so, you know, there's, I know it's controversial, um, but fundamentally, you know, when you really dig into it, I, I, I don't know anybody who, who has done like a deep dive and actually, you know, taken the time to learn about it that, that isn't just blown away by the implications and the utility. Um, and then as Nikki just pretty awesomely went over, um, you know, there's a lot to do with long read sequencing, um, multi-cancer screening, and cell and gene therapy, all of which are, are awesome. And, and hopefully we'll have enough time to kind of go through it. I'll try to be super quick. So go ahead. All right. So, so deep learning, you know, I think it's important that you understand deep learning is essentially artificial intelligence. And it's basically teaching a machine to think for itself. Um, and why that's important is because once machines can, can start thinking for themselves, they can actually just automatically take actions, um, pretty much like how you do any kind of command in your computer. So this, would, this will allow an explosion and a turbocharge in the amount of, of things that we can do uh, especially, especially in medicine. Um, but you're also going to see this kind of transfer over to like autonomous vehicles and things like that. So, um, so, and what's important here, you know, I highlighted the other part is, is, you know, there's a $30 trillion market um, that's out there that can be potentially taken advantage of. So this is kind of just the history of deep learning. And you we kind of think of it as like software 2.0, um, where over the next decade, you know, it's basically computers thinking for themselves and, and coming up with solutions to problems in real time um, that will simply, you know, if, if you see here from that curve that starts at 2015, you know, that it, it's pretty flat, but you, you see how it's becoming more of an exponential curve there. So, um, you know, and, and based on, on how this is curving, it's either gonna make an S curve uh, or it's going to keep going up exponentially. So um, our, you know, believes that it will continue to go up exponentially. Okay. Uh, so deep learning, AI, uh, all applicable to conversational computers. So, you know, we see this with our Alexa, you know, um, another company I know that Nikki covered uh, quite a while ago. Um, that I've actually made pretty good profits off of, Serent. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's conversational in the car. So, you know, I think you can almost kind of meld those two conversational computers inside your car, right? Um, and then we have consumer apps, right? So one, one kind of area that I'm particularly, um, you know, I, I think it's going to be very lucrative in the future is as you see, um, advertisers start to move off of those traditional platforms and more onto social media. Like you still don't even have like the big Cokes and, and all these other products in the world that have moved their advertising strictly over to like social media. And so, you know, deep learning and AI, I mean, you probably see that all the time when you, you can't go on Facebook or whatever without, you know, getting bombarded with, with advertisements. So that probably will continue. Um, and then sort of permeate into, into other areas of social media. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so uh, this is actually a pretty cool uh, slide when you sort of look at it. Um, so for deep learning, there is sort of like a cost, a time cost curve when we look at um, how long does it take to train a computer to learn something and then and then come up with solutions on its own, right? So I basically circle or I put a, a box around um, all these sort of um, all the the um, software that's associated with Google. So Google um, is by far and away, you know, they've acquired DeepMind um, and they've just done a ton of things um, that, you know, they're, they're basically built a moat for themselves in this area of, of deep learning. So, you know, and this is kind of why you see like Google in like Arc G, you know, um, you see like Baidu uh, also as well. Um, so uh, Tesla, you can see there. So, so this basically is like a function. This is like a function of cost and, and how efficient the, the machine can learn on its own. Um, so next slide. So the DeepMind, uh, which, which is basically owned by Google um, that I was talking about before, um, is super, super important. So basically, you know, Nikki talked about how, you know, we can, we can if you sort of look at the, 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 the first one there, um, solving our protein problem um, is, is probably one of the biggest things that are, is going to accelerate um, human advancement in genomics because it's not just enough to take DNA and read it. You have to be able to read it and translate it into something. And the thing that it translate that it translates into is a protein. But it doesn't just stop from there because as you kind you know you can you can go ahead and 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 take the DNA, read it, and then use that to, to translate it into a protein, but then the protein has to fold. It has to fold into a certain way in order for that protein to be functional, right? So, so DeepMind um, has won, you know, the past several few years of awards for coming up with computational methods to basically predict how a protein is gonna fold. And so if we can do that, if we can do that, then we can essentially figure out, you know, what that protein is for and how we can use it. And this could potentially cause like an explosion in utility in the field of genomics, um, in particular, the, uh, uh, an area you, you hear genomics and then you hear proteomics. Um, and so genomics, meaning like DNA, whereas proteomics is more associated with proteins. And, and you'll be seeing a lot more of that. Um, so, so go ahead in advance. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, so this is just kind of showing, you know, you have this neural network, you have this computer, right? That can basically take a look at the protein and then it just comes up with all these computational decisions that can determine how the protein gets folded into something useful. Okay. Um, so, Another area that deep learning is, is you know, I, and I, we've talked about this uh, previously, you know, if you're, if you're a, um, an awesome 10X insider, you know, I've, I've dropped a few companies um, that is, they're basically using deep learning. They're using um, artificial intelligence to take a look at images, right? So using the computer or using the software to look at a CT scan or look at an X-ray or look at an ultrasound. All these things can be used basically, you know, not necessarily taking the human element out of it, but making it better. And so you can see here for Alzheimer's, right? Look at the error rate. Look how low the error rate is there for deep learning compared to just con conventional, you know, radiologists. Look at bone fracture, like the computer, the computer, made fewer mistakes in detecting a broken bone, okay, than, than the actual radiologist. 
cancer, breast cancer. Again, human and deep learning can go together and make something even better, right? So you have a human radiologist through, you know, a little bit over 3% error rate. You have the deep learning software with about a, you know, two and a half, but you combine those together and, you know, it's not, it's not a, a, a zero sum game, you know, we can, there's a, a common misperception out there that, you know, comp and, you know, and I think it's just kind of Hollywood drama that, you know, computers are, once they start learning for themselves, they're going to take over the world. Well, you know, there, there, there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, sensationalism in that. Technology has always, you know, required humans and, and we've always gone hand in hand with them. And, and it's probably just going to, it's going to save lives, basically. So, um, okay. Um, so this is just kind of more. Um, so if you look over in the right corner, um, this is kind of a company that we've talked about before, um, ultrasound. So basically, um, you know, this is super important because you can give somebody who, you know, let's say a physician is out in rural Philippines or, or they're out in the mountains. Well, what can they do? They can basically do an ultrasound, right? on their phone with a small probe, the ultrasound images get, re get um, sent into the cloud. There's AI software that looks at it and can make, and can make a, 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 help you make a diagnosis. So this allows, you know, th this allows physicians or, or, um, or other healthcare providers who don't have proper access to care to be able to go out and, uh, and, and practice better medicine, right? So, um, you know, we've talked about this is currently a, a SPAC, um, uh, LGVW, I believe, um, still super cheap, in my opinion, um, for, for, for basically what they can accomplish. Um, and we've also kind of talked about another x-ray company that sort of does the same thing that, that I won't discuss. Um, we'll, we'll keep that for the, for the inside crowd. Um, so go ahead. Uh, deep learning AI chips. So this is kind of another way. Um, there's a company, you know, I, I think everybody kind of knows about this chip company, but but their processors are in a ton of of, of healthcare software. Um, and so yeah, we'll we'll kind of we'll kind of just leave it at that. Um, so, you know, this is super important. Um, deep learning is essentially, you know, it, like, like the slide said before, it's internet 2.0. You know, if you have internet and it had, you know, it's created a $13 trillion market cap, you're essentially looking at, well, now you're, now you have deep learning that are connecting the computers and analyzing data in ways that um, just simply, you know, it's like going from radio to television um, when you when you really think about it. Um, so, you know, I, I totally agree with this here. You know that, that, and we're already seeing it now. You know, you you go on, um, and you can a lot of times now you can even get a customer service rep. Um, you know, there's like a little chat bot that comes up and, and then just like just tries to help you solve your problem. So. Um, yeah. And go on next. Yeah. So 13 trillion, lots and lots of money. Um, all right. So uh, a little bit about Bitcoin. Um, you know, this is just kind of showing the, the history. Um, you can kind of freeze it and, and go back over that yourselves, but it, 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 it's the interesting history in Bitcoin. Um, this is just showing, you know, adoption and network effects of it. Uh, next. Um, so I like this slide um, and, I'm, and, and I'm actually really glad that they included it because, you know, I think the important thing that you really need to look at is up top here, right? So you're getting, a, 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 you're getting more and more and more black here. What does that mean? That means that an increasing number of people 
who have owned Bitcoin and have never sold it is increasing more and more and more, right? So, and then you're starting to get higher percentage. You know, you have over 60% now, over 60% now of people, you know, who have who own Bitcoin uh, that have had it for over one year, right? So what that kind of tells you is, is, is that, you know, the, the, the ownership basis is, is entrenched, right? It's not just people, you know, trying to flip crypto coins and, and, and trying to make profit off, okay? Um, so, you know, I, I mean, you, you kind of look at this chart and, and, and see, um, you know, just an awesome chart really. Um, but, but really what it's showing is, is that, you know, it's not it, it, people that owned it previously while at the same time, you know, that base is growing, you still have people buying, there's still people buying, um, even at a higher cost basis, right? So, I mean, it, it really just shows you, you know, there's there's market capital demand here, um, probably like we've never seen before. Next. Um, so this is just kind of a list of, you know, uh, once again, you know, you have regulators um, in the U.S., uh, in Europe, saying, you know, we're 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 not going to hide away from this. You know, there, there's a, a an argument there that you know regulators are going to try to, um, you know, come down hard on crypto. Um, but in, in my opinion, I I think regulation is welcomed. Um, I think that will actually help a lot of people get over the hump of adopting it um, because people people don't like to go in um, on things that that they just don't have, you know, that they're uncertain about of, of what kind of laws are going to affect it. So I, I think, you know, I, I think there's a clear path here towards, you know, very fast global adoption. You have banks, JP Morgan, right? So Jamie Dimon, who, you know, I know previously, um, you know, had comments, but they, they spent, they're, they're, they're low key spending billions of dollars to set up a, a, a cryptocurrency exchange, because guess what? Once the government actually does sort of issue out cryptocurrencies and stuff like that, they want to be the first platform that can do it. Right. So, so, um, you know, so when, so when you hear like, Oh, well, what about the banks? And you no know, banks are low key trying to get their ducks in a row to get, to get this rolled out because um, they're they either adopt it or they're probably not gonna uh, do too well in the future. So and then you have institutional investors. You know, I think most famously uh, recently Michael Saylor, but you know, value investor, right? So like Paul Taylor Jones. You know, the only person missing here is is, is like Warren Buffett and, and and Ray Dalio in terms of like um, in terms of value investors, but, but you know. Um, so, and then I think the thing that put the, that put it over the hump really this year, um, was Square and PayPal, right? So when PayPal and Square kind of adopted it and everybody, you know, at least in the U S and in, in one form or another has like either Venmo, PayPal or Square. Um, and so that's huge, right? So them having access to buying crypto 24 hours a day, I, I think, that has really put it over the hump in, ter in terms of adoption. Um, go ahead. Yeah, and Sophie. I actually just signed up for Sophie um, in in my account. Just got approved, so it's like a little bank in my in my in my uh, in my pocket. Um, so you know, Arc. They're basically saying here that you know Bitcoin moves on its own, right? So there's nothing. There's nothing that you can kind of correlate Bitcoin to, right? To the S&P, bonds, oil, everything. Now it did dip um, when the market went down in March. Um, I think that was just kind of, you know, one of those things where there's a lot of uncertainty. So, so you just have like this insolvent event where everybody was just trying to, trying to get the cash. So, um, but I, I think, I, I think, in future events, I think what you're going to see is actually the reverse. I think you're going to see people going to Bitcoin versus away from it in times of crisis, right? Um, 
same way as they, they, they kind of do with gold and bonds. Um, okay. Um, so they're just basically saying here, you know, like it doesn't make any sense to at least allocate 1% of Bitcoin to your portfolio. Um, and they're predicting that, you know, um, as more and more institutions start investing up to um, anywhere from 2.5 to 6.5%, that that could elevate Bitcoin's price um, by 200 to 500,000. So uh, personally, I don't even think that needs to happen. Um, and, and, and it probably would make it a lot higher than that if, if they did allocate more than that. But um, yeah, I won't go into that. So uh, next. Um, okay, so I mean, you just look at this and look at the top. Bitcoin, since 2010, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's the best performing asset. Like there's nothing else that you could have owned in the past 10 years that would have performed better. Okay. There's nothing else that you could have owned. So basically, if you if you just had one to five percent of Bitcoin in your portfolio, it probably it, it probably would it would be the best performer, and you and you would have um, and, and it would represent a much larger percent, um, if not the highest percent of your portfolio at this time. So um, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so this is kind of just comparing, um, adoption of the internet. So I know, uh, I don't know how old most people are, um, but I, I do remember, you know, when I was in high school in like the, the nineties, um, you know, the internet was like becoming a thing. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, it's just like everywhere. Well, you know, crypto, uh, um, crypto and blockchain, um, you know, the, 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 the rate of its use is accelerating um, at a higher pace than the internet. So, and next. Um, so I think this is a, a pretty cool slide because it shows that, you know, when you look at that circle, see that blue circle there? Um, Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, you know, they're basically disrupting media you see either you know you have facebook netflix and all those disrupting the network television you have amazon disrupting all these retails um healthcare you know being disrupted and then of course you know banks and and everything are, are being disrupted um with fintech right um so so yeah um and and basically like the market cap of all these, all these entities get absorbed into these, have gotten absorbed into sort of like those, you know, those those large mega caps. So if you go on to the next slide, um, this kind of uh, brings home, you know, what sort of the the emphasis is with crypto. Um, so you know, if you really kind of think about crypto, what crypto is uh, is sort of something that that connects. Um, it sort of opens up um, the internet and makes it, makes it accessible for everybody, right? So over the next probably 10 years, you're going to see more and more and more adoption to the point where blockchain and crypto is actually going to be absorbing, you know, a lot of the things that we look at now is, is like the super disruptive um, entities right so they're all going to kind of have to flow through the blockchain so like e-commerce any transaction you make it's probably going to flow through the blockchain um gaming and how we connect with each other even advertising all that um is probably going to flow through the blockchain and what what that can do is it allows you because it's decentralized um in in, in your you you have control of your data right so, for instance, advertisers, you know, versus, you know, right now the system is, is that you are actually the product, right? So Google wants your data. Facebook wants your data. 
well, on the blockchain, you know, nobody can have access to your data unless you want to give it to them, right? And advertisers can even pay you, pay you, right, for you to look at their advertisements, right? So this is more of a of of a of the way capitalism should be, in my opinion, right? Um, so all these things will flow through the blockchain, healthcare. Um, and this is kind of why you see ARC, you know, if you really look at, you know, a lot of the things that they invest in, um, like DocuSign, um, PayPal, um, a lot of things that you just kind of don't, don't really, um, Zoom, uh, Amazon, all these companies that you just kind of don't really think of, like, but, but really one of the reasons why they like them is because they understand that blockchain is the future and they're already creating a niche like doc in the example of DocuSign with blockchain smart contracts and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so yeah, so basically, you, you know, the, the thing with crypto um, is, is it creates a network, right? So just like, just like how Facebook and, and any other sort of um, vast network uh, entity has taken off, um, more and more and more adoption and more networking um, creates more value, essentially. You know, it, 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 it's Metcalf's law. You know, the more, you know, if you go all the way over and look at networks, the more connections that you have, the more valuable everything is. And I've already told you, blockchain is the thing that connects all the computers. Well, if computers were the thing that connected people, right? And now you have a thing that can connect all computers that just creates more value, right? Um, so Web 3.0, I won't, I won't beat you guys down with, with any more of this, but um, this is really good to kind of go through and really understand what Web 3.0 is. Um, and I'll kind of leave it at, you know, um, our, our awesome 10X members, um, I've, I've kind of been beating the drum on a particular uh, penny stock um, that is basically trying to become like the Ant Financial you know, the, 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 a little Sophie sort of, um, for web 3.0, uh, and why that's important is because, you know, when you're on web 3.0, that, that means that you are not, you know, your data, the data is not centralized. So, so guess what? I can send money or bank with, uh, with Nikki, right. And I don't have to go through the bank and it's going to take days or weeks right? So borderless, borderless payments, borderless connections, all that stuff is super, super important. Um, and, and I, you know, I think we're going to do really well with that particular company, right? Um, so next. Uh, yeah. So also kind of all the things that I was talking about, like creating autonomous business, um, digital business, digital marketing, I think that's a huge thing. And I think once that kind of gets figured out, um, a, lot a lot more people are gonna be happy about the way digital advertising is done. Cause I think right now it's just like, you know, nobody likes, you know, you, you have a conversation with a friend and next thing you know, you know, your phone is like advertising to you because it's, it listened to what, <laughs> what you were saying or, or whatever. Um, so, so sort of decentralizing that, you know, I, I feel like personally, I feel like that's important. Um, so, so I'm all about it. Um, yeah. Uh, just kind of talking about the, the FinTech and DeFi. So right now in the middle, you know, we have PayPal and, and, and the Ant and all that. Um, so we kind of trust those entities, right? Um, but but the problem is is, is that you know you, you you just have like this kind of global situation where um, currencies and things like that are, are not going to be as valuable as they once were, um, and then it, it creates a limitation. You know, like you like if if, if somebody has PayPal um, in another country, I can't you know necessarily send them whatever. Um, whereas you know if you have DeFi, uh, you. Can, you know, it's open, you know, the, the, 
the secret to crypto, um, and I and I think what kind of makes it beautiful is that it's it's basically hiding in plain sight, right? So everything is open, everybody can see transactions, um, but at the same time, it's secure. Okay. So, and I know there's been kind of talk about, um, you know, well, this is used for like criminal enterprises and things like that. Well, you know, um, this is going to get vastly improved. And, and uh, quite honestly, you know, if you're a criminal and you're moving money um, on a blockchain, you, you're, you're probably a dumb criminal um, because, you know, the, all that stuff is open and everybody can see it. Um, this kind of just going through, you know, um, fluctuations of the price to book value um, with the central bank. Um, and so this kind of just shows that um, as the as the central bank um, at number of assets kind of grow, um, the price of Bitcoin goes up. Uh, and this is kind of like the first year that we have all the major central banks. Um, I mean, this is basically showing that all the central banks are printing money um, and, and devaluing their currency. Uh, and this is the first time in Bitcoin's history that you basically have the entire world doing that. So. Uh, kind of just another example of, of how, how um, the central bank's assets, you know, are, are highly correlated with price. Um, and the thing that kind of sticks out to me here is that you see the uh, you see the spike, the major, the huge spike there at the end. Um, the light blue one is the is, is the central bank. How big that has spiked, and typically the price in Bitcoin has lagged it. So um, yeah, I don't. I, I think I think it's at the beginning of the S curve. Uh, we could just keep going through this. It's fine. Yeah, bond. Some price correlation to bonds. Um, you guys can kind of kind of take a look at that on your own. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I, I I was trying to figure out how to just plop these in one by one, but this is kind of how I come up with a price for Bitcoin. Um, it's not just something that I kind of just pulled out of thin air. Um, so if you kind of this, this is basically the price action of Bitcoin since since its inception, right? So if you take a look at um, the blue um, numbers there, that's showing you the percentage of, of increase and decrease, right? So basically what I did was take a ratio of, of, of the changes in the price of Bitcoin um, with each cycle. So for every cycle. So for one, um, the rate of increase um, was 1.3, right? Um, for the next cycle, um, the rate of increase or the rate um, was at five. And then, uh, I'm sorry, for the, sorry, for the first cycle, it was 13. Um, and then the second cycle, it was five and then 2.5. So basically what I'm saying here is that, you know, if you take the price, right, and we know that Bitcoin uh, at the bottom of this current cycle was 3,000, right? Um, we can We can pretty much, you know, we can predict that the rate of increase from Bitcoin from the base is going to be 4,200%, which gives us a base price of 100,000, right? Um, and then if you, at the top in green, uh, it did ratios of the price to book values. So um, you can kind of just go through and see that, you know, the price of the book has, has increased over time. So, and that's, a, that's an effect of, of network adoption. Right, so more and more people having demand for it, um, the price of the value has increased. So we can pro so we so basically at the end here, next to the four that's circled in the right corner, we can predict that the price to book value at the end of this cycle is going to be seventy eight. Okay, so if we say that the price to book value from seventy eight, um, that that gives us a, a top a top I think for this cycle of two hundred and forty thousand. So. So, so um, I'm saying here right now that, you know, I think that Bitcoin is going to go to 130 to 240,000. Um, where it's going to fall to, um, you know, it, it's hard to say. Okay. 
All right. Um, so Nikki covered a lot of the genomics. Uh, I don't know. Do you guys want to continue to go through? Do you want me to just like bust through this real quick? I mean, okay. it's good. So let's still continue. No worries. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Awesome. Um, so next generation sequencing. Uh, so Nikki kind of covered this, but I think what's important to, 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 to see here is that second paragraph, ARC believes long read technology, long read technology, right? By two, 2025 is gonna be more accurate, right? And the cost, the cost is what's important. You know, even in medicine, you know, I, I, as a physician, you know, I can't go and order a big expensive test. Like I just can't do it, right? So the cost has to equal the value. Um, and so they believe that, you know, it, it, as she mentioned with Wright's Law, you know, cost improves as time goes. Um, so, you know, revenue, that's just going to generate more and more revenue. So next. Um, kind of went through all this. Uh, you can kind of just start clicking through. Um, it should highlight each part. So the first generation Singer sequencing takes tons of time. Illumina, um, Illumina BGI, that's Beijing. Um, they've basically had the market cornered uh, for, for, for quite a while now, um, but your, this middle part is really kind of, I, I think the era that we're moving into, right? So she talked about bio nano genomics. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that bio nano is better then pack bio, um, I think what, it, and we'll kind of see this on the next slides. I, I, I think they work hand in hand. And I think, I think, by, I think bingo will pick up things. Maybe that, that um, pack bio right now can't see, um, but eventually pack bio because it just, and it'll explain it more in the next slides. But, um, and if you look down, there's a couple companies there that, that I really like too that I'm looking to add. Um, so, so 10x genomics, um, you know, they're they're in single cell and spatial biology. Um, so, kind of talk about that. And then BLI, BLI is another another strong one. And then uh, NanoString is, is is another um, pretty strong company that that I really like. It's just a matter of trying to get the right price. <laughs> So, um, so kind of, you know, the way I kind of think about um, and, and we're, what we're talking about now is just reading. We're just trying to read the genes, right? This isn't for, for, for treatment and things like that. You know, it can be used for it. But when you think about, you know, small reads versus, so, so this SRS is basically what Illumina does. And, and you can kind of think of it like reading a book, right? If you go to read a book, OK, and you can only like take little fragments of words throughout the book. And then now what you have to do is kind of put them together to make sense. Right. Versus a long read. Right. So now well, what if I can what if I can take entire sentences and try to put the book together? OK, so common sense to tell you it's much easier. Right. To try to go ahead and make a, a clear picture. To, to make a, a more uh, comprehensive book by having entire sentences to put together versus just individual words, okay? Um, so, so that's kind of like the, the most layman terminology that I could use to explain why long reads are, are better, okay? So that's short, yeah, the short reads. Yeah. Um, and so this kind of converges now with deep learning, right? Um, if you have you have um, deep learning methods uh, and artificial intelligence that can sort of piece all those sentences in that book together for you, right? And it can kind of think and figure out um, what's the best way to put those to put those sentences together. And so that's kind of how Google in their in their deep um, the deep mind works. Okay. Um, and then there's other there's other sort of um, companies that do it as well. Nanospore, um, they're also a long read, 
and they could in 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 an actuality they're probably going to read like so if like <clears throat> so if pack bio can read like entire sentences then nanospore can read like whole paragraphs right the problem is as the, as they sort of mentioned here in that last paragraph is that they're not as accurate okay so um so even though they can read larger sections it's not going to be as accurate Um, and then the market market for it is is pretty big, um, and you know right now I, I think the market cap for for Pack Bio is, is like it's like six or eight billion or something like that, um, and you know their revenue streams are, are just going to continue to increase. Um, so yeah. So you know we've been pounding pounding the table on Pack Bio. Um, I've been pounding I've been pounding the table on it ever since uh, Illumina. I used to be a big investor in Illumina, um, but as soon as they as soon as the deal fell apart with Pack Bio, it's like okay, well, Pack Bio is, is four dollars, so I, I guess I'll just buy them. Um, but you know it's pretty clear that you know being able to to read longer links is just better in the long run. Um, it, this company is just going to grow and grow. Uh, I mean, if you look at, you know, them basically replacing, potentially replacing, you know, what Illumina does, or, or at least digging into the market share of what Illumina does, I mean, I, I, you know, it's huge. Uh, next. Um, so 10x genomics, we kind of talked about that. This is actually kind of cool because what they do is they can basically um, they use beads and they can link um, like all these different sort of methods that are being used in genomics. So I, I really like 10x genomics. Um, you know, it's really just kind of a matter of getting the right price action um, for it. So I won't go, go too much into it, but you can see 10x genomics can be used everywhere. Uh, there's a recent collaboration um, for Invite. Uh, impact bio. So um, you can go on. Yeah. Um, so Invite is kind of like a, 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 a direct to consumer um, genetic testing. So, you know, I'm not, they, they didn't really say like what they're going to be doing and stuff like that. So it's kind of hard to envision, um, you know, Invite kind of just doing whatever on their own. They're probably going to have to be using like Pack Bio's product, um, and then Pack Bio just sort of works through and Vita to get to consumers. Because right now, Pack Bio, you know, they're, they're just simply like a you know like a research entity. Uh, so Bio Nano Genomics. Um, so Bingo. <laughs> um, Bingo's kind of cool because you know they're they, and why I say they kind of. Pack Bio and Bingo can sort of work together is because right now, um, by an energy genomics, like like they can zoom out even further, you know. Um, and what they can do is sort of digitalize what they're seeing and put put sort of all the their all the um, all the mistakes that we see uh, on the on the chromosomes and and sort of build um, a, an idea of it's in, let me just put it this way. I think that bio nanogenomics, I, I think that there's more applicability in the clinic, right? So a lot of times when you look at like Pack Bio and Illumina, a lot of those machines, you know, those are those are used in like research, a lot of research and development. And a company like bio nanogenomics, I think is something that, you know, I think you'll actually see these in the hospital um, and, and, and use actually quite frequently just because of how how scalable it is um, and, and, and how it detects things that we, you know, we know what we're looking for. So, so I, I think it's gonna be very useful. Um, this kind of just shows you, you know, it, it can digitalize um, the abnormalities that we're looking for. Uh, and, and I think that's something that's gonna be super useful clinically. 
Um, so yeah, that's what I, I expect a lot more of those for, for BNGO. Just gotta wait for it, right? Uh, liquid biopsies. So basically, um, you know, kind of, kind of what we do now um, is we have to go in and we have to cut away tissue or, or, or basically get a sample of tissue. And so liquid biopsies, um, you know, this is, it's already becoming a thing, but it's going to allow us to detect cancers a lot earlier. Basically, you know, just from drawing blood from somebody, we'll be able to sort of detect whether or not cancerous uh, molecules uh, are floating around in somebody's blood. And that can be from any number of cancers. So, the, the, you know, as you can imagine, the market, um, market for that is huge. Um, <clears throat> and why that's important is because, you know, you can save lives. If you can detect cancer earlier, the chances are that it's going to be more localized um, and that you can actually just go in and, and take it out versus, you know, if you, kept, if, if you detect a cancer, you know, later on after it's spread, um, unfortunately, you know, the, 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 the survival rate isn't, isn't great. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so based on a single uh, sort of blood test, um, and this is just showing, you know, the market for this is, is huge. We already have like um, a couple companies like Color Guard, where you know they look for DNA, you know they look for cancers DNA um, in the stool. Um, you know we do this like with prostate, some some molecular markers with, for prostate cancer. Um, so this is already kind of being used, and, and it's already been shown that there's a huge market for it. Um, and you know as you kind of spread that out to to maybe like detecting. Um, pancreatic cancers, lung cancers, um, <clears throat> breast cancers, you know, all, all these kind of cancers, they, they secrete molecules, they secrete certain types of proteins that we just have to put the pieces together. Um, and once we kind of have those, <clears throat> once we kind of have those pieces, um, this multi-cancer screening market is it, huge. You know, it's going to be somebody goes in and they get their blood test every year for you know a battery of different cancers and it's not going to be like all right now i, I got to get a mammogram and a colonoscopy you know those things will work hand in hand because if you are detecting things earlier there's actually going to be a bigger market for getting doing more colonoscopies because you'll detect it earlier and next yep and uh, <clears throat> um we talked about uh, uh skin um, some new technology that um, there's markers uh, is basically, you know, piece of, piece of tape that you put on your skin. Um, and there's very specific markers that are expressed by, uh, by skin cancers. Um, and so we kind of discussed that. Um, there's actually another, another company as well. Um, that, that kind of works in that, in that same in that same area, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so um, one is uh, Castle, Castle Biosciences. Um, so they kind of do something very, very similar um, to what to what Derm Tech does, except so Derm Tech will basically, you know, both are looking at, you know, you have a you have like a mole on your skin that looks abnormal. Um, and so derm tech, <clears throat> basically, you know, you can test that mole to see if it's expressing any sort of, you know, cancer, you know, bad cancer um, uh, molecules. And so that, that can help potentially help you avoid having, like, getting a biopsy. Um, and then castle bioscience is, uh, is more for, like, trying to figure out if your melanoma has spread somewhere. So you kind of have, you, you know, you really have like a really good moat here. Yep, with uh, Castle Biosciences, it helps you, it helps you figure out if, if, if melanoma is potentially metastasized. So, um, yeah, and this kind of just, you know, you could take a screenshot of this, but um, a lot of these aren't publicly traded 
companies. But so if you look at like this early detection area here, um, exact sciences, they're the ones that make that color guard. So, you know, instead of getting like the colonoscopy and stuff, you, you, you basically send your stool in and it gets tested for DNA. Um, Garden Health, um, I believe they have like some, some lung cancer um, nasal swabs that, that they can do. Um, there's a bunch of sort of uh, Chinese companies that, that are pretty entrenched with like um, basically like just doing testing, not necessarily on the tissue to figure out what markers are there to direct treatment. Um, and then ongoing monitoring. So neo neo genomics, I believe, I believe, is publicly traded. So a lot of a lot of these are, are probably going to get swallowed up by some of the ones that are bigger, like Thermo Fisher. Um, we can go on to the next one unless anybody has a question. We have. I guess we can do questions at the end. Uh, so gene therapy. So. Um, I won't go crazy with this. I think the important part is sort of Nikki went over sort of the CRISPR um, part, but autologous to allogeneic cell therapy and then ex vivo to in vivo um, gene editing uh, are super, super important concepts I think, to understand. Uh, so, so previously, you know, like a lot of the, the, liquid tumors, which would be like leukemias. Um, they've been uh, mostly been able to develop um, chemo after like more targeted sort of um, treatment for that, but they're getting better with sort of um, trying to get like the molecular markers for solid tumors. Um, and there's one particular company that I really, really, really like. That was a very good platform that, that I'll share um, that is, is very directed at solid tumors. And so I, I think it's actually a really good price to get into it right now too. Um, so uh, you can go ahead. Um, so oncology trials shifting from autologous to allogeneic cell therapies. Um, I kind of, I'll explain this a little bit more, but basically, um, you know, taking cells from somebody, um, sort of cleaning out all the bad stuff and then giving it back to them has sort of been like a, a, a better, like there's less risk to it and, and less, like less risk for a, a bad reaction, um, versus, you know, taking, you know, taking like bone marrow from, from a relative or something like that, there's more of a risk that somebody could, um, that can have an adverse reaction, right? So that's kind of why it hasn't, it hasn't scaled as effectively as, as previously. And then on top of it, um, you sort of have like this, this risk curve um, with rejection, but, um, but it's actually going to be a lot easier to use and more cost effective if we can move more and more and more towards allogeneic um, treatments. So, yeah. um, and then also gene therapy shifting from ex vivo to in vivo. Um, I believe the next slide sort of go into this more um, and why and why 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 we want to try to why we're trying to get more into in vivo versus ex vivo. <clears throat> um, so when we talk about ex vivo, right, um, that's basically, you know, we take the gene, right? So we're talking about gene editing, and then we sort of slice and dice it up outside of the body, right? And then basically inject the, the, the corrected cell um, with the corrected DNA into the body in hopes that it will sort of um, uh, uh, be therapeutic um, versus in vivo. Uh, we'll click the next one. Versus in vivo, right? So if we could just, you know, eliminate that whole first part of, of altering the, the genes outside of the body, 
and then just inject, you know, the drug into the body, and then it will go directly to the DNA that it needs to and, and, and make the changes inside the body. Um, well, you know, you just eliminate, you just eliminated a lot of time and you just eliminated a lot of cost, most importantly, right? Um, this kind of just kind of goes through exactly what I just said. So um, doing it sort of in vivo versus versus ex vivo. Um, so Nikki, Nikki already talked about CRISPR. Um, I kind of, you know, I, I would even just dumb it down to being like CRISPR is basically cut and paste. Okay. It's, it's just like if you're in a word doc, you know, if you go in your snipping tool and you snip the image and then you just pasted it right back in, um, on another page, that's basically what we're doing here. Um, you know, but it, there's a lot of things that go in between there, which is basically figuring out which gene is the problem, um, figuring out how to locate it, and then um, all the tools that you need to, to correct it. Um, and CRISPR, you know, next to Watson and Crick, basically discovering um, uh, base pair, you know, actually figuring out what the genetic code was. CRISPR is probably like the next greatest evolution in, in in, in, in genomics and medicine uh, since Watson and Crick. Um, but, but yeah, CRISPR is a uh, cut and paste baby. Uh, the market, you know, obviously is huge. Um, our entire bodies run on DNA and the translation from the DNA. I, I think, you know, if, if eventually a lot more medicines um, in are more uh, uh, genetically based. Uh, I mean, you're you're just going to see like a cornering of the market with it. So, um, you know, we're we're still kind of in the early stages. I would say though. So, I I, I would say you know if you're going to be investing in um, a lot of these companies, I would not sort of expect like you know these huge returns uh, at least over like the next six months to a year. Um, but but it, but it, I I think. You know, I, I think the compounding and returns on this over the next five years are, are, are probably is probably going to be one of the best investments that that really you could make. Um, and so CRISPR, she kind of talked about it already. Um, they're they're working on some some things that um, allow us to target um, specific cells. Um, based on ba based on sort of uh, immunologic markers. So these are basically like little markers on the outside of cells that allow uh, our own immune system to, to detect it. Um, so CRISPR is doing a lot of uh, cool things. Um, I think the price has gotten maybe a little bit away and, and maybe I just don't kind of see where they're at in terms of, in terms of their valuation. So I'm, I'm, I, I don't hold CRISPR right now. Um, yeah, that's kind of just going over all the different ways that CRISPR can be used. We can go to the next one. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so repair. Um, repair, I, I like a lot. You know, I think this platform, they're using a CRISPR platform, um, and they've identified a gene um, in cancerous cells that basically, you know, they're, they're kind of... <laughs> They're kind of unrepairing, repairing this gene. Um, and I think that they're going to be able to, to use this with a multitude, a multitude of different cancer drugs. So you're basically looking at, you know, you're basically looking at something that is not going to be the specific drug. It's going to be the drug that goes along with all the other drugs. So I, I'm, I'm all about repair therapy. Uh, repair therapeutics. That's my boo. So I, I think the price is good right now too. So, um, and and this is what I, what I was kind of talking about um, was you know I talked about how how liquid cancers um, and then the evolution uh, of treatment is evolving to solid tumors. 
And so, you know, these are potential targets for for repair. Um, I mean, you just see it basically every type of squamous um, <clears throat> cell cancer that exists, you know, they, they would be able to target and, and you know, and all these different organs. So, um, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty chubbed about this company. Um, this is actually really cool. So this is kind of where it gets a little fun. Um, and I know Nikki was talking about it. Uh, and so, so basically, uh, twist, <laughs> twist bioscience, um, they basically can synthesize DNA, right? So if you can synthesize DNA, you can basically create machines. So you can create little cellular machines that, that are able to produce basically anything. Okay. So we're talking about chemicals. Um, so we're talking about like maybe silk. Um, so like clothing materials. Um, I think they produce like, uh, I, I think they have like one of the biggest things that they produce is ginkgo. So chances are if you take ginkgo every day, um, they basically, you know, synthesize uh, into, a, into some yeast, put a gene into some yeast that allows it to produce ginkgo. Okay. Food, right? So uh, I know Nikki talks a lot about, you know, the secular trend and, and, and how, you know, the world population isn't getting any smaller. Um, and, and so food's going to become scarce, right? So the ability to, to, to synthesize um, uh, uh, food um, and especially vitamins, right? So a lot of, a lot of you know, essential vitamins, those can be synthesized. Um, therapeutics, of course, diagnostics. And then this other thing here on the end is actually super cool, um, data storage. So you can actually store data in DNA, right? And you can, you could, you know, I was, I, was, I was reading that you could basically store um, all the data on every computer in the entire world. Um, if you stored all that information in DNA, it would fit into a shoebox. Okay. So just think about that, you know, like all the, <laughs> the huge computers and cloud and everything like that. If you just put all that information in DNA, you could basically put it in the size of a shoebox. So, um, Next. Uh, and this kind of just shows how data storing works, right? So you basically, like, say you have, like, a, a code, right? You could basically, a, you know, ACTG um, are, the, are the DNA codes. And so you just sort of create, like, a, a um, you just create basically, like, a coding model. Um, and then you can synthesize that code into the DNA, spin it, blah, blah, blah. And then you know, store it essentially. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of, like, you know, like Jurassic Park where, you know, they were able to like make the dinosaurs from like millions of years ago. I won't go that far, but, you know, we can already sort of extract DNA, right? We can extract the DNA from like a frozen Neanderthal and analyze what his DNA was like. So, you know, we're talking about something that, you, you know, DNA stores. Um, and somebody could open that like tens of thousands of years later, and it's not going to be like, uh, um, you know, it's, it's basically not like a chip that's going to erode or, or, or anything like that. You could store it safely for like a long, long time. Um, so I have um, this is kind of just a, I tried to highlight some companies that I, I think are, are, are like really worth looking into and investing in because I kind of believe in what they're trying to do. So basically this company, um, they're, they're, they're figured, they found a way essentially to, if somebody has a cancer in their body, to take out that cancer. And then what they do is they try to look at the, 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 the immune cells that were able to penetrate inside of the cancer, right? And so we know if those immune cells if those specific immune cells, they had something that allowed it to penetrate the cancer, basically we can take those cells out and then put something in those cells that will allow it to kill the cancer, right? So it's basically taking out the cancer, taking out the stuff that's inside there that it needs more of to try to kill it, and then infusing it back in the body. So 
So I advance, I, I think, you know, when I, when sort of when I look at these companies, um, it doesn't always work out because, you know, I, having a professional opinion doesn't always agree with the market, but I, I've, I've found that if I can just find something that I think is going to be super useful and, and that it's going to work, um, even if it doesn't work out, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with investing in it um, because I, I think it's something that's going to do a lot of good. Um, and this is kind of one of those. I, I don't know if it's going to work, but, but, but it's worth looking at. <clears throat> um, Care DX. Um, so they're kind of using genomics. Uh, in a lot of different ways, but more precisely for transplant medicine, okay? So transplant medicine is super complicated and you deal with a lot of rejection. So like if you've ever known somebody that's gotten like a, a kidney transplant or a liver transplant, you know that they have to take a lot of medicine to try to keep their immune system from attacking them. Um, and so, so CareDX is another company that um, I think it's really important sort of um, what they're doing. And I, and I, and I think I really like the leadership um, and so I'm, I'm definitely, I've been kind of waiting for like a pullback in this company, but I, I definitely think that's one that, that people should look at and consider investing in. <clears throat> um, yeah, so Accolade, um, this is sort of like going into um, software, right? So there's specific companies that develop software for healthcare um, and Accolade is one of them. Um, and that's kind of, you know, like if you're really thinking about like uh, Teladoc and like your Amwells and stuff like that, well, you know, there's software providers for those companies. Um, and so it's, you know, Accolade, um, Pure Storage is another one. Those are kind of like your pick, pick, uh, picks and shovel um, for software for virtual care. Okay. So I'll, I'll say that again. So like Accolade, Pure Storage, those are like uh, Viva is another one. Um, th those are your pick and shovel software providers for your virtual health. Um, and this is kind of just all the, all the ARC um, invests and, you know, as of yes, yesterday or the day before. So um, no, no I, I can go down and tell you which ones I'm, I'm specifically invested in, Teladoc, Twist, PacBio, um, not in CareDX, I'm not in Exact. Um, ones that I'm, uh, in Vitae, I'm in. I'm looking to get into IOVANCE. Um, <clears throat> I am looking to get into, hold on, actually, I made a list here. So, um, so Twist, um, I, I really like it. It's actually pulled back. I think I bought a little bit this morning because <laughs> it, it pulled back to like 163. Um, but some kind of some safe companies, I would say, are Exact and Roach um, and Novartis. Um, those have like super extensive pipelines uh, of medications and then exact has, has a pretty good niche and has already a big market. So I think if you're just like, I want to be invested in this, but I want to do it like safely, um, probably exact and Roche and like Novartis and your thermo fishers uh, or what you, what you want to go with. Um, another one that I really like is personalis. Um, they're in uh, liquid biopsies and then also doing mass spectrometry, which is super important for like proteonomics. Um, so I, I would consider getting that. I think the valuation is good there. Ionis, um, they're kind of like Moderna, except their platform um, uh, allows them to sort of be, be like a, a little bit more potent in terms of their MR, mRNA targeting. Um, so, so I really like um, Ionis, um, uh, BLI, re BLI, I mentioned earlier, but but um, I was looking at their their revenue growth. Um, but that's Berkeley, um, Berkeley Lights, and the, their their revenue growth is, is pretty impressive. So, um, Nikki mentioned Beam. Uh, I, yeah, I, I like that one too. Um, I, I think maybe it's gotten away a little bit, but I think it also at the same time, if you look at like what they're trying to do, they're they're basically trying to make CRISPR more precise, right? Um, so if you can kind of go in and, and do point mutations um, that, that allow you to make subtle changes um, that could be adopted um, pretty vastly. Um, one that also I think is, is going to be really good, and I think they're going to have some like reporting of data coming up, is, is Intellia. Um, I think that's NTLA. Um, so they're basically kind of doing exactly what CRISPR has done. Um, and, 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 and they're supposed to be reporting that data pretty soon. So. 
as with most sort of farm pharmacological companies, um, when that data comes out, the price goes up. So, um, and then Freesia, Freesia is another one. Um, that is a software. It's a software company as well. So there's three software companies. If you're kind of you know into that sort of investing in just healthcare software, Pure Storage, Accolade, Viva, uh, Freesia. Um, and then what was the other one? Nanostring was the other one. So Nanostring and then um, 10X Genomics. So, so you know, there's quite a few of them. I mean, or you can just like invest in ArcG. Um, but I kind of, I, I prefer sort of, you know, to look at the ones that I like. Um, there's some other ones, you know, I, I think there's some areas um, that ArcG maybe is like missing out on. Uh, one in particular, um, I think there's a lot of business and a lot of cost saving that can be done. Um, a lot of times people have to go in the hospital to get um, drugs infused into their veins. Um, and so there's companies um, specifically like SC Pharma um, that's looking at like different forms of antibiotics um, and then also like diuretics that can keep people out of the hospital. Um, so that's kind of like another area um, that I expect eventually will, will, will sort of disrupt medicine. Um, and then also some of like the imaging readers like that we talked about, um, but there, there, there's a lot more other companies out there specifically like, you know, Butterfly um, and then also ICAD. ICAD is another one. I, I, think, I think the value is not there for, for actually what they do um, in terms of just like analyzing x-ray images and then, and then getting an interpretation of those. So um, yeah, that was, I know that was a lot, um, but It's a lot. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, I learned a lot. We learned a lot. <laughs> we'll, we'll go over these ARC investments. Uh, yeah. So yeah. You probably like read, I don't know, read all these annual reports of each one, like all their presentations, or you were like just um, in the field. That's why you are aware of the breakthroughs. Yeah. So I kind of, um, um, I do follow it. Um, so a lot of like, the like the healthcare conferences um and then uh on you know just getting like news feeds and stuff like that like on genome genome web um so i did i did in kind of preparing for this learn a lot um about healthcare software that was one area that, that i was kind of like oh what is this you know and so that that, that was kind of uh, got me thinking about in, investing in like pure storage or something like that um i'm still kind of like um, I'm, I'm warming up a little bit more to, to, to CAR T. Um, but, but honestly, I'm not right now a huge believer in sort of like this immunological targeting for treatment. Um, because I just think there's like a lot, there's a lot more to figure out than, than just like some of the other, uh, some of the other mRNA, um, in, in CRISPR targeted treatments. So, yeah, it's interesting. So I learned a lot. I mean, I, I didn't know about these uh these industries until I had to learn it today. So thank you very much for your time. We took yeah. a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got, got a little away, right? <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I I I really I really appreciate it, Nikki. And um, you know, I I, I hope. I hope uh, I hope I was able to to help some people out, um, and you know you guys have been great. And, and Nikki, you're awesome. Um, Thank you. Thank brilliant. you, Doc. We'll learn about your recommendations. I'll study all, right. all the recommendations you shared today. I'll deep dive it. Thank you for them. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. All right. See you again. Uh, see you sometime physically here in the Philippines one day. Yes. Yeah, we will study all your picks and uh, we'll give an update to all the awesome 10x members out there who are also yep. watching the show. So this is a free Friday class. We want you to appreciate all the awesome 10x classes that are Fridays is free, but Mondays to Thursdays join us for some deep dives on some interesting uh, secular trends that are actually going to affect your life and will actually be a great position on your portfolios. So know what you own diversify and have an awesome 10x life thank you very much 
拜。